I was just talking to somebody about uh, having signed up for a, a webinar for next uh, couple of week's time to, to try and find out how to do um, print media online and social media all at the same time, uh, which is a particular challenge of mine now in my current role. So, uh, right, so I'm the context setting guy and I'm going to talk about um, how we got here and maybe as I do that, draw some, um, give you some thoughts about what you need to be thinking about now because of what might or might not happen next. Uh, so I'm currently the editor of P3 Pharmacy magazine and in that context I'm delighted to say that uh, on a fairly regular basis we carry uh, little gems, little pointers about what you might like to think about in your business from real world analytics. So uh, delighted to recognise that right, right here, right now. Um, and I hope we will continue to do that as we go forward next year. So that's my title, The Long Term Plan and or The Five Year Deal, So What? And I'm going to um, suggest to you that uh, in my, uh, the, the means that I've got, I'm going to go back 11 years and say that a lot of this stuff which is happening now has been coming for at least 11 years. And that um, I think uh, along the way you might have possibly missed one or two key signals that have actually ended up with us where we are now. And therefore what happens and certain documents that come out from the centre are actually really important. And if we don't read the right stuff, uh, then a lot of these things that are happening right now are going to be a bit of a surprise. And uh, while the, the kind of people we have in this room, I think, probably do read more than most, I think one of the biggest challenges for community pharmacy right now is actually engagement and, and understanding not so much what has to be done, because there's a huge amount of material out about what needs to be done when and, and, and all that, but why and where those kind of thoughts potentially lead us. So I'm going to talk about the 2008 white paper pharmacy in England. I'm going to talk about the five-year forward view, um, the NHS uh, management's um, basic hands-up exercise to say, we've run out of ideas, it's over to you locally, can you see if you can do better? Um, community pharmacy 2016-17 and beyond, which is the, um, the uh, December the, uh, 2015 uh, love letter from uh, the Department of Health. Um, uh, the community pharmacy response to that, and then also uh, bringing us right up to date, the NHS long term plan, the five year deal, and the community pharmacy contractual framework, and just some reflections based on some recent conversations I've had in which you might possibly spot a theme or two. Okay, so pharmacy in England 2008, widely um, welcomed when it was published. Uh, it included things like uh, the Healthy Living Pharmacy Programme. Uh, the new medicine service. Uh, it talks about pharmacists prescribers being the norm. It also introduced this concept of a health community clinical pharmacy team, uh, which absolutely hasn't gone away uh, and is very much part of the um, primary care network uh, approach. And it also highlighted some significant concerns with medicines that have been around for quite a long time about the safety, about high risk, uh, high and high risk for that also read high cost medicines. Um, the spectre of non-adherence, which has been around, I mean the first big report I remember on non-adherence was in the uh, mid 1990s I think, when Merck Sharp and Doe worked with the Royal Pharmacy Society of Great Britain to produce a huge uh, review of non-adherence. And it also um, interestingly highlighted um, the issue of medicines use in residential care. And had it not been for the 2010 election, I think we would have seen action on uh, medicines, medicines use in residential care, um, if there hadn't had been a change of government, we may well have seen action on that very early in 2010. Because almost one of the last things that the outgoing Labour administration did in 2010 before the election was held a big summit about sorting out medicines in care homes. Um, so, and that's nine years ago, and they're now sort of working on that now. So, a lot of the things that we're seeing now either directly relate back to um, pharmacy in England, or they illustrate that um, when people have ideas that they think about, and this would have been two years in the development, I guess, um, and those people don't leave the department. Pharmacy in England was written largely by Keith Ridge, but also um, by the then Director General of Commissioning, a guy called Mark Britton, 
who is now one of the kind of global leaders of KPMG for health. Um, if the people don't change, but the ideas will seem to be sound and well thought through, they actually don't go away, and they just wait for the next kind of iteration. So that was 2008. Um, the five-year forward view, the NHS, his own um, attempt to think slightly differently about strategic management. Um, diverse solutions, local leadership. So great opportunities for, for local leaders, usually GPs, isn't it always that way, to think about how they would how they would change the system if they were given the opportunity to do that. So not don't let's not wait for somebody like Andrew Lansley to completely screw up the system again by having a bright idea in his garden in Cambridgeshire. Let's, um, let's actually see about the innovative um, smart people out of the system who actually say, do you know what, if I control it, I do X, Y, Z. And uh, that's what they did. And most of the ideas didn't work. And some of them clearly did work because they have now reappeared in the long-term plan. Um, it was also about money. But it was also um, highlighted, I think, as a really key strand of this whole quality agenda. And that included, surprise, surprise, patient safety, patient experience, clinical effectiveness, and enhanced health in care homes. And then we had the letter, a very challenging to the sector. It was a challenge, it was a challenge to past processes. Um, it picked up on themes in the five-year forward view about efficiency and productivity. Uh, it talked about a clinically focused community pharmacy service. We can argue all we like about the words and the semantics about whether who's clinical and who isn't. Um, but that was in the letter. And that is, a, I think, a, a, a link back to the 2008 white paper. And uh, in amongst all of that, um, there was a, you know, a huge challenge. And the response from the sector collectively was to highlight um, roles of pharmacy in facilitating personalised care for people with long-term conditions, uh, first port of call for episodic healthcare advice and treatment and the neighbourhood health and wellbeing hub. Um, and I, there's no evidence that I, what I'm going to say now is true, but actually the key is. Um, the piece was actually well received inside the government, uh, particularly the bit which talked about implementing it. Uh, and I think that's where we kind of missed a bit of a trick because we then lost sight of the implementation plan. So what's the NHS long-term plan? Built on the five-year forward view, um, takes this idea of primary care networks, localities of 30 to 50,000 people, and then links that to an integrated approach in which different professionals come together to, um, to support people in those localities. 30 to 50,000 is a sort of a natural number. There's lots of European systems based on 30 to 50,000 population units. Uh, so it's perhaps no surprise that uh, in England we've also got to that point. I did some work in Norway in um, 2001 when they were liberali liberalising the market and they um, very much were focusing the thinking about <coughs> how, how the pharmacy network would be affected by basing their strategy on um, their uh, sort of council structure which was at a local level 30 to 50,000 people. Um, the NHS Long Term Plan again highlights uh, work to be done in care homes and very much building on the research evidence which suggests if you put a multidisciplinary activity into care homes as a specific activity, um, not only will you improve care but you'll save quite a lot of money, particularly in the drugs bill, uh, typically 40% in year one. So it's perhaps unsurprising that they are very certain to do that and they hand out a whole work stream of people, um, including pharmacists, going into care homes to sort some of that out. Um, I've been interested in care homes uh, and the use of medicine in care homes since I was a third year pharmacy student in 1981 when I wrote my dissertation on it. I don't think things have, um, I don't think things have improved very much since 1981, uh, but I think Waz and the team um, are, are going to really change um, the model and sort some of those things out. Um, it also highlights in the plan um, a, new, a new move for prevention. I mean, I still remain to be convinced that, um, it depends on the election, I guess, but I still remain to be convinced 
that, it, that prevention programmes, that they're serious about prevention programmes, um, because it's always the first thing that gets cut. Um, but those, the prevention programmes and the new channels for immediate care, where sort of pharmacies reflected in the NHS long term plan. Right. So, community pharmacy angles. Um, I think the long term plan signalled a, a shift in which we had to start thinking seriously about local leadership. And, um, you know, if it doesn't, do, it doesn't take a genius to do the math and say if we're going to have units of NHS activity around 50,000 people. That's, in the population of England, that's over a thousand of those. And that's going to be quite challenging, particularly if they do get ahead of steam and start wanting to do things a little bit differently. So there's a challenge of their immediate for local leadership. Um, the immediate care kind of then links to why, why the word pilot programmes of the digital minor illness referral scheme and the um, uh, NHS urgent medicines um, supply service and so I think you know there's a kind of telegraphing where that slide to end up. Um, helpful I think also that pharmacy has been exploring some of those prevention programs more formally than previously uh, but I think it also suggested uh, in the way that it talks about pharmacies that um, given the investment into general practice with um, practice pharmacists that the time being long term conditions for community pharmacy might not be a priority area. Uh, and the really interesting bit, and I still don't think we've quite, quite worked out whether this is valuable or not, is a kind of a reorientation around enablers. So, yeah, they talk about efficiency, and um, you know, the headline for that is uh, automation, central fill, uh, all of those kind of things. And one or two things have been said along the way which haven't helped, I think, people think about efficiency um, aside from thinking that the answer is a robot at huge cost. Um, but also seeing skills development as a huge enabler, and that includes prescribing, but it also includes leadership. Uh, and I think also, um, I think there's a very clear signal in there that they're going to use standards to drive up quality. I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that. So now we come to the five-year contract deal. This is kind of, this was an easy slide to write because it sort of follows sort of that one. Uh, so local leadership, yes. Um, DEMA has and NORSAS become the clinic, um, community pharmacies consultation service. Prevention programs are in there in terms of pilots, formal pilots, um, a bit like we had with the DEMAs and the NORSAS a while ago. Um, forget long-term conditions for now. And I think that's also, that also did signal the end of NURs before it happened. And it's got those key enablers. So those enablers that are in the um, NHS long-term plan are also um, underpinning the five-year um, contract programme in one way or another. And of course it's got these bits in it as well. Um, and I'm sure that speakers today are going to talk a little bit more about the challenge of flat funding at 2.59 billion, um, the pharmacy quality scheme that was the whatever it was called, same initial, same initials, different acronym. Um, but clearly, a signaling now. I think it's going to ramp up the patient safety element. It's in, there's a lot of things suddenly in there that have been around for quite a long time, and some of those audit programs. Um, I think. Uh, I think I might have even been involved in some way in one or two of them, uh, going right back to 2000, 2014, 2013, 2014, something like that. And also, um, the oddest thing for me, and I don't know the answer to this generally, but I think the, the initial start being made to tackle, tackle issues around reimbursement is just to start. I'm looking at Gavin now to see if he's nodding. He's not nodding, but he's raising his army breath. <laughs> it's just to say, mm. so, so I think that's just a start. And personally, I think it's a Trojan horse for radical redesign of reimbursement mechanisms. 
which if you think about it, in a, in a contract uh, program that kind of changes and has an annual agreement, um, I know it wasn't quite annual, but you know what I mean, yeah, every year is kind of a new, new arrangement. Um, you fall into that system where, as a young civil servant in 1991, I was told there were certain things that weren't done uh, just before an election. Um, and they were the sort of things that their civil servants would in the old, in the old language say, hmm, you want to do that, Minister? That's a very brave decision. In other words, are you barking mad? Well, those are kind of things you tackle in sort of year one of administration. So interesting that we've also now got an election which will reset the clock for a government. Um, I mean, who knows these days whether the government's going to last five minutes or five years. Um, but what's impossible in an annual system suddenly becomes a little bit more um, contemplatable if you've got five years to think about it. So I think what's that space, I think all those consultations that come out around reimbursement are really, really important. Um, and I think it would be quite a neat trick to get slightly ahead of the game in thinking about options. I will come back to that because I did ask Simon Dukes a very specific question about that, and I'm going to show you his reply in a second. So that's um, from 2008 to where we are now. I think there's some very key themes running through there. Now, in my job now, the greatest, the, the greatest pleasure I have is I can basically go and talk to who I like. Um, and so, and not only do that, but then repeat back what they say, which makes sense to me, in print and online, uh, which means other people can read it too. So. Um, I've been going around talking to one or two people who've said some very interesting things that maybe just reflect a little bit of what I've said in terms of direction of travel. So here's the first one. Um, I call this Reflections from Recent Conversations. So from the NHS, I spoke to uh, Dr. Ridge, I think in March. So probably even slightly pre-long-term plan. Um, and certainly although it's being talked about, but it's now to come over. Um, this is going to sound harsh, but this is not a game. Uh, yeah, I mean, I fundamentally think that's always true anyway, uh, things that, given that there are people's livelihoods on the end of this, it absolutely isn't a game. I think you need to take, um, take stock of what people are saying and why they're saying it. But I think if you were to bury into, burrow into what he has said over his tenure in, um, in the role, I think that's broadly speaking where he is, although he did kind of lose a lot of faith in some of that, I think, um, over the last three or four years. Uh, but he wrote the 2008 white paper with Mark Britton. So I think a lot of those things really flow into that. Um, now this, this third one's going to help a lot. Get the minor illness service spot on. That's what they're calling it at the time. It's got to be high quality. It's going to rightly focus the attention of patients in a different way. We'll see different versions of that in the next couple of slides. Um, the long-term plan is the shape of the future, that's where we're going, and the primary care network is a game changer. He said that several times in public, uh, as has Bruce Warner. Um, I still think the jury is out about how much of a game changer it's going to be, but they're certainly putting a lot of investment of hope in the fact that PCMs are going to actually start to move things towards a more integrated service. And then there's a, those enablers there in, in the end. Um, there's a slight sort of threat in there that pharmacists need to sort of shape up and what do we train people for if they're not going to think about what those skills mean for patients. But, um, but he's always been talking about that. So that's sort of key through. So that was March. I think we published it in April, maybe May. And then I spoke to Simon Dukes probably a month or so after the announcement of the um, new contractual framework. Um, and I think these are my sort of takeouts from what he said. Uh, we have to start looking at ways in which we can build capacity for services we have wanted for years. Um, I think it's actually quite important to see that some of these things have been talked about for a long time, and now we're at the point where push comes to shove and you have to deliver them. Uh, the second one about the um, community pharmacist consultation service, we've got to deliver it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, 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 there's a heck of a lot 
riding on that. I'm sure others will talk about that later. Uh, the pilots. Um, <coughs> I think the fourth one is interesting. Uh, I used to spend quite a lot of time saying to people, don't wait for permission. Um, you know, ask for forgiveness afterwards. If you wait for it, you, if you ask, wait for permission, you can wait forever. You've got a good idea, and it seems to make sense to you, it makes sense to people around you, um, then why not start with that and see where that takes you? Um, and I think with PCNs and with um, the new forms of local commissioning, that is absolutely true. Um, and then I did ask him right at the end of my conversation, so I, I did pose to him the, the thought that the bit about remuneration, uh, reimbursement was a kind of a Trojan horse potentially. And this is what he said, let's explore different types of funding models and reimbursement mechanisms which reward what and where we are trying to go, all ideas welcome. And I, I particularly like that bit because I do think pharmacy occasionally waits for somebody else to say what the answer is when actually the power of the sector as a whole and people who run businesses and that work and that don't work um, ought to be able to think some of these things through. And I think there's an opportunity there for pharmacy to have a radical rethink about reimbursement, to see what it wants and what it thinks it could deliver. So I should be watching that space. My last one, not published yet this one, so you get a special preview. Um, Anit Kapoor, uh, who did this, um, the last one actually of these in Manchester in, was it May? Kind of? So I've just spoken to Anit at huge length. Um, I also highlighted in my um, leader this month that if people really only have time to read one thing this month, they should absolutely read this. Um, what Anita had to say about what, uh, not only about the new contractual framework, but what in Greater Manchester, Greater Manchester LPC is going to do about that, his own personal philosophy, which he kind of runs through his whole sort of business and into the LPC, and then genuinely amazing, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it works out, transformation of the LPC to be fit for helping contractors across GM and make the most of national and also local opportunities. So that's where Anita is. Uh, prescriptions are boring. Um, we need to be doing things that are focused, clear objectives, immediate feedback, ticks all the boxes for me. I could have put five slides of the stuff he was saying. Um, you know, eminently quotes Paul. Um, we want to make sure this CPCS is not a big monster, it's what you're doing every day, and now you're getting paid for it. Um, the LPC structure is led by a director of pharmacy transformation. No chief officers or secretaries anymore. Director of pharmacy transformation. I'm not sure they've appointed that person yet. But to me, that sets an ambition. And it you know, on behalf of the 700 or so contractors uh, in GM, excluding Bolton. Um, that's where they want to go, and uh, you know, he's leading on us. And, and I think really interesting as well, they've got a act, very active provider company, the provider company needs to pave the way contractually, I want it to go with the testing model. Don't talk about potential, we've already done this over here, you've got a problem over there, you can do that over there, here's how we will do it over there, just give us the money. Uh, you know, I wish him all the very best and um, uh, there's six pages of that in the November issue of um, P3 together with a little bit of whittling on from me and uh, um, so I, I would just say it could be online uh, possibly even by the end of this week um, so if you don't see or can't wait for a paper copy have a look at that so that's neat so in, in summary I think the direction of travel was set years ago um, I genuinely think the response in the past shaped the opportunities of the future. Um, there's three different, uh, three people with very different perspectives actually saying the same thing. Um, the NHS is going to send people into pharmacy, so I don't know what the, I saw the tweet from Pinnacle uh, after day two, 1191 through your system, Gary, I think. I don't know what the number is now, but maybe you have that figure. It started. Um, so, yes, uh, the CPCS is really important <coughs> to get right. Uh, half fast implementation, we're going to do, I've certainly said that before. Um, and LPCs need to think seriously about what they're for over the next five years. And I think, you know, there's some modeling in Greater Manchester, they have some serious advantages in terms of scale. Um, but in terms of ambition, I think it's worth a look. 
Workforce is crucial in this money for skills development, including leadership. Um, that can support all types of services. And you know, at the end of the day as well, um, if the NHS does succeed in sending people to pharmacies on a more regular basis directly, um, they might also want something else as well while they're there. So um, I haven't talked about that yet, but there is a whole kind of raft of things that people need that we just don't sell them right now. Um, and let's be honest, we all know that's actually true. Uh, so we might even see some ticks in there, the front of the stores as well as um, a challenging time at the back. 